first off introduce two farmers here that I really have a mountain of respect for. So Mike Unsicker from the Morton area, just 10 miles uh, north of us here. He and his family run two machines up at their family farm. And then, of course here in the middle is Aaron Bear, who has helped me for years and is my farm manager. And this Proving Grounds wouldn't happen without Aaron. Does a tremendous job of keeping Greg grounded. And so I thought it'd be natural, since Mike and Aaron are friends, that we would just talk a bit about from the deer side, things that we do and things that we look for. And uh, I'm a little nervous for this fall because Aaron just got married three weeks ago, so I don't quite know how this first fall is gonna go, Aaron. I, I have, what do you think, Mike? We'll see him some. You're gonna have to keep a short leash on. Keep a short leash. I think we just gained another operator in the Ooh, evenings, that's the way I look at it. I love the way you're thinking. We'll have Stephanie right along with us. So let's just talk about, for you two, things that you do the first day. So we've already set up that this corn is not your normal corn field. You know, we got ear height 18 inches off the ground. We got rubbery cobs. We got 32% corn and stalks that are dripping with moisture. So, but in, in the first day for both of you, let's just start with you, Mike. Tell us a little, walk us through a little bit. How do you go about just getting yourself in a fine tune in that sweet spot? Um, so when I got an opportunity to farm in Morton, we uh, learned how to do uh, a power shutdown. And I became real fan of those. Um, you, you obviously, you stop the machine and you get out and you look from the front of the head to the back of the machine and uh, try to determine if you're leaving anything on the ground and uh, look inside the machine. Um, we had the advantage, Greg, you and I growing up of going back and opening the door and looking in the looking on top of the walkers to see what we were doing or opening up the door and looking to see what your tailings look like, physically right. look at it. Now yeah. it's a meter. Yeah, we used to reach down our left there and we could pop a door open and we could see exactly yeah. what the tailings was coming up. And uh, I don't know what to ask Aaron, how in the world this all this fancy technology, he's even learned how to run a machine. So it's sure been nice. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have to fight all that dust and dirt. Um, you can, I think because of that, for me, I was able to really learn how your adjustments will change your results. Yeah. And that's that's been really helpful, and it's it's really helped. Once you understand it, it really makes running a combine enjoyable. Yeah. Well, you know, we've switched over, you know, now been quite a few years into the rotor families. All, most machines in the marketplace are in the rotors, but at the same time, uh, it, it's easy for us with the horsepower we got to overrun these machines. And so both of you, what, what do you look first when you're in the cabin running? What are you doing? What, what, tell me, work me through what are the things you're doing besides looking at yield monitor, but uh, what are the things you watch? So the, um, the, whole, the whole process of a combine is truly that. You've combined a lot of processes that we used to do individually, right? That's right. why the combine is call the combine so you almost have to start at the head it's what we visually watch each pass for pass through the field we're looking that we're not overrunning the corn that our head head speed's high enough that the feed feed rate is smooth and even into the combine but we're not running any faster than necessary so we don't want uh, ears bouncing out the front we want to minimize shelling as much as possible and then the deck plate spacing um, it's obviously very varies depending on stock size yield and whatnot there with the yield saver that we've been running the last year now, that's really kind of made it so we can run a little wider deck, deck spacing and uh, still achieve all the, getting all the kernels into the combine. Uh, so that's been nice. But once you get the, the head kind of set for the speed, then you're looking at the rest of the machine. Can the machine handle the speed you're trying to run? Um, just like Mike said, you gotta do the power shutdown to know the settings you've set on the concave, the fan speed, is it truly getting all the grain off? And then is the cleaning shoe able to keep up with the way it's separating it? So once you kind of achieve, once you kind of figure out the uh, capacity of the machine and each hybrid that you're uh, harvesting, then you can set, make sure the head is, is matched to the combine and then follow it on through and make sure your chopper is spreading it out the back, the full width of your pattern. Uh, I agree, you know, that combine pass is really setting the stage for the next season. And I think sometimes we maybe overlook the job we do with the 
out the back of our spreader and how we manage residue is a huge part of how 2018 is going to go for us. So what, what do you feel like, Mike, uh, over the years, what's some of the biggest challenge that you run into? Uh, maybe a certain type of hybrid or is it ground condition? What, if we went back three years, what what do you say, boy, that was probably, maybe it's 2015 it was so crazy wet, I don't know. But what, what, what do you think is your biggest challenge with the green machines that we run? Um, for me, probably um, maybe keep some cob chips out of the tank. Yeah. Um, trying to master that. Um, it, uh, on some of the smaller machines that we run, uh, power, you're continually watching your RPM, and then kind of like Aaron said, you're you're matching the machine to what you what you have to work with. Yeah, and uh, just try to keep everything, keep your RPMs up, and keep the uh, keep the efficiency or the, the production up as much as you can get out of it. Well, that's probably a little bit of that 250 bushel corn you guys are yielding. <laughs> yeah, we had that burns once. a lot of power. <laughs> I notice on this new machine that our farm is going to be running that the very back shoe on the sieves, doesn't have the individual fingers, it's got a solid plate, and you were mentioning that early this morning, Mike, that could maybe have, give us a little bit of a vanish on tailing. So, we talked about that at the uh, at the combine school the other day, so hopefully we'll see some advantage in high moisture corn with that. Yeah, so both of our families, we like to go out and get it, and so it's not uncommon, we'll be in that 28, 29 when we start, um, and I know you're very similar, and then as the season goes on, so what do, what are you guys looking for as corn starts drying down? Well, you take some of the newer genetics that we have, you know, we'll drop almost a point a day sometimes in the, when the first start out. So what are some of the things that you guys are looking at on there? So definitely as the season goes on or even as you change from uh, early maturing hybrids to later maturing hybrids or vice versa, you see quite a range of, uh, of different characteristics the way the combine handles it. and Drier corn typically with these machines, we find our capacity goes up. We can a lot of times increase ground speed, put more bushels through the machine. And sometimes that'll uh, force you to increase fan speed if you got more grain on the shoe to get some of the, the residue blown out. And if you're changing your ground speed, again, you're changing your head speed probably to match that. Yeah, no so, question. And sometimes in the drier corn, we find that we can open the, uh, the concave up quite a bit further and let the corn on corn action shell itself that way instead of having to beat it so hard with the rotor. Yeah, I agree. You know, quality in the tank is huge for us. All of us want to take something to town that we really like to, that we'd like to represent from our farm. So other things, you know, um, we talked with, with Mark and Aaron a little bit about on, from the soybean side, uh, anything different there that would be dramatically different than the corn side. Uh, I know we run drapers, Aaron, I'm, uh, are you on the drapers likewise, Mike? So, and that's changed our world. It's been a wonderful thing. Oh, yeah, that's been fantastic. Anything there from a bean side, as, as it gets in the evening and late, Aaron, what are some of the things you're watching as, it, as the sun goes down and maybe we're in some green stem beans, besides we lose power? Yeah, so definitely a, a power consumption, but uh, with these machines, they find it, uh, it's pretty amazing, the efficiency uh, the power usage, you, as it gets wet in the evenings, you can really push it right out the back. Um, so you got to really watch. The loss monitors do a phenomenal job of picking that up, but sometimes it is good to go out and make sure what you're actually getting in the uh, getting out the back, and also make sure the loss monitors stay clean. Sometimes that wet residue hairpins in there, and you got to clean it out so that the soybeans actually do read. But uh, they, they love the soybeans, and if they're dry, they feed right through. Anything to add to that, Mike, and which things do you notice different than Aaron? Get involved in some seed beans from time to time. So you're, you're, you're judged on your splits wow. and how wow. your sample looks. So you're always conscious of can we keep slowing this thing down or can we keep widening it out? You know, as it gets drier during the day, you do, and then when evening comes, start picking up moisture. Then you got to start reversing the process, and still keep the quality of the of the grain up. Yeah. But all the adjustments are there, and it's super easy, and that's uh, it has gotten better. Yeah. As we look ahead, you know, we work with a lot of the different growers around the nation that are raising 
national corn grower winners that are raising 500 plus. And so as you and I, as a group here, we think 10 years from now where yields could be, and I think there's a good chance we could be over 300 bushel. What do you think, where do you think, I just give me a off the cuff, where do you think technology is gonna need to go to handle that kind of capacity? Moving the grain away is quick enough is a lot of times a big challenge, especially with wider heads and trying to make it even one pass through the field opening up or edges, just literally getting the grain away from the combine quick enough when you get to that high, high yielding corn can be a real challenge. I agree. Which is a good challenge to have. That's a great problem to have, need more trucks. Mike, you said something to me this morning, we were talking about machines you run with 12 row heads and you made a good point. The box that you own is not the largest series because tell me a little bit about what you told me about grain carts and uh, trucks. Oh, okay. So um, by going to the 12 row heads, it seems like we didn't, we can't get as far down the field as we could with an eight row head distance wise and it gives the auger guy auger wagon man a chance to catch up with yeah. you without having to stop and that's that's worked really good for us you know i think all three of us run combines but if we are perfectly honest a good grain cart operator makes or break our day and you know all of us need to be as farm managers when we're selecting hybrids we need to know how that hybrid cuts we look at a lot of things disease standability yield but at the end of the day, those two young guys that Aaron and I run beside us, they make or break us. And when it's right, it's about as sweet and much fun as it gets. And when it's wrong, it is painful. So uh, On the radio, an awful lot sometimes. Yeah. But a good day for me is when I don't hear anything on the radio for like four hours at a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> so other things that, um, that we need to talk about, because, uh, you know, by no means are we... OEM specialist for Moline. It's just that we've run these machines and I think both our families have had good success with them. We get a lot done with our double machines run side by side, but uh, anything else you'd like to throw in? I think just the best, the best success we have is when we get out often, you get a chance, check behind you, waiting on an auger wagon for two minutes. Great opportunity to get out, walk around behind the machine, even open it up. I mean, the more times you get out, the more confident you are that everything you grew all year long is ending up up in that grain tank and at the elevator. So that's really the end of the day. That's what you got to do. Got to be willing to get out of the seats every once in a while. That's, we run together, Aaron and I, and so we look out for each other. We, we talk a lot about where our settings are. And if I'm out looking at my machine, I'm looking at the pass next to me. He just ran and we're not scared to uh, help each other out. And I know, Mike, you have the same thing with your family. So, uh, Works good. And when I get really stumped, I just call Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you guys are good friends. Well, you know, in the early days, we didn't have near the technology and yield monitors. So from, I'd like to hear from both of you, first of your opinion, and then how comfortable are you with the results? A little bit about how you use them and, and how you maybe even calibrate them. I think for me, having it calibrated and, and when you start getting into drier corn, don't be afraid to stop and not, or take the time to do it again. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's all about remembering and, and knowing what you're harvesting this year, kind of so you know what to do for next year. Absolutely. Part of your, part of your homework. Um, it does, it does take a little time to discipline, to go ahead and make the time to, to adjust, make your adjustments and, and go through the process of calibrating. Yeah, I would agree completely with uh, the information is only as good as, as what you do calibration wise. If your calibrations are way off, you're, you're really wasting your time. Why do you even own a yield monitor? So it's very important and we find opportunities all the time to check it. Opening up a field, it's a great time. A lot of times even with our heads, we're forced to stop and unload on that first pass. So we try to get a weight and just compare it and see how close it's following. I mean, we run the the yield sense from precision with in our system. So it's a real easy one load system to recalibrate. We check it often. The more time, the higher the moisture change seems like, you know, can sometimes throw them off. Uh, we've run the deer system, the ag leader system, both very accurate systems, just got to keep them calibrated. They're all the same. They need that input from the user. Well, with, with scales on our grain cards, it's just a matter of discipline ourselves to do it. 
and it makes those yield maps that we all use come next February mean a lot more. Absolutely. No question. One of the things I've really enjoyed in the deer series is we now have the ability on the go to change our head pitch. From both of you, give me a little feedback where you like to run them and do you do it and, and flatten them or you leave it pretty standard? Well, now that they've made it really easy to do, we adjust it a lot more yeah. <laughs> from the cab. Uh, we try to run the the, uh, the corn heads as, as flat as we can get them. Yeah. When you hook to your draper, that's not the angle that you need. And you can change it in the field and it work. you know, just weather, just the moisture conditions. If it starts pushing in beans, you can, yeah. you can roll it back. If you want to cut a little better, you can roll it forward. And it, uh, it's, a, it's a really nice, nice thing to have at your fingertips. You bet. Absolutely. It's a feature we've been looking forward to having for a number of years. And uh, down corn, another spot where we use it a lot. I mean, last year we had to fight through a couple hundred acres of it, and we were playing with different pitches, even even throughout the same pass sometimes, right. to get the stuff to feed in and keep the combine moving forward. So it's a uh, essential tool on the combine. We're thankful they've got it. With the ability to always change from the cab on the go, is there times that you see a disadvantage to having that technology where we can get really, really flat? Well, you can definitely uh, get yourself in trouble if you uh, flatten it out a little too far. Uh, you'll find the residue will actually try to wrap under there on the, on the stock rolls, and it may not even feed out the back of the head the way it should, uh, especially if you're trying to run low and keep your stock short. So there is definitely a two flat and there's a two steep for every guy that might be a little different depending on his conditions, but it does give us the ability to, to find that sweet spot in each field. You know, Aaron, as we finish this up, there's one thing Stephanie might not know about you, and that's that things need to be lined up exactly right. So the, one night it was late and I had a lecture grain in my tank so I couldn't close my tank covers. Aaron already parked his combine and I've been around Aaron long enough. We line up everything exactly. Snout, every snout's gotta be perfect. If not, he'll go move it. And so we jumped in the truck late at night. We were pulling out in the road. He looked back and saw that my tank covers were open. His had already been closed. We had to go back in the field and open your tank covers because I couldn't close mine just so that it, otherwise, I don't know if you'd have slept. Probably so, uh, not. Where exactly did you <laughs> learn that from? Well, I, I got to say, uh, Mike's probably been a little bit of an influence on me there. I just, <laughs> I feel like that's something that they've done and it looks professional and seems like we care about our equipment when we do that. We do. So. We do. And, and I'd say, I'd say there's actually a functional reason. I'm not sure about the hopper thing, but the lineup kind of helps you with the fuel wagon I was in the say, morning. In the you morning, can just go right down the lineup. With so. the two tractors and auger wagons and combines perfectly lined up, it makes our fueling team really happy. It looks professional and it works well. Well, we hope that Stephanie won't watch this, so I think you're in good spot. <laughs> I know for a lot of you to the far south that you might have already finished up harvest, but for those of us here in the Midwest, this will be a good opportunity for us to get our head in the game and start thinking about some tips and just getting the kinks out. And I wish each and every one of you a tremendous successful yield and a safe harvest in 2017.